Next Thursday is the big day. Next Thursday, okay? Every day is a big day, but uh, next Thursday is a bigger day than some. I'm sorry, this Thursday, what did I say? <laughs> well, you know that um, different countries say next in a different way. So, yes, the Thursday of this week, okay, so let me correct that. I said it in a European way, okay? But I'm glad, I'm glad you know that I, I don't have to tell you. Okay, settle down. Don't you wish it were next Thursday, though? Okay. But, well, you shouldn't have corrected me. Okay, so the exam will be here for everybody except for the students of Dario. If your TA's name is not Dario, you should be here. And if you don't know the name of your TA, <laughs> then you shouldn't be here. You know. <laughs> By now, you shouldn't remember the name of your TA. And th this concerns only students of, uh, which, uh, which attend the sections of Dario, two sections. And they will meet in a different place. OK? Now, there is a lot of information uh, which I have posted on, online on, my, uh, on the class homepage. <clears throat> which you have a link on bspace. bspace is really the master, the master page from which you have a link to everything. Okay? So in particular, you have information about the midterm exam, you have the mock midterm exam, you have uh, review problems. Okay? And uh, after the class today, I will post the solutions to the, to the review problems for the midterm exam, as well as the uh, solutions to the last homework assignment. Okay? Now, just want to mention, want to emphasize one thing which I already mentioned last time, which is, which is that um, you will be allowed to have one page of formulas like before, uh, standard size on one, on one side, okay, exactly the same drill. Don't use the one which you used last time because that would make it two-sided, right? I mean, if you, you can use whatever you want. You can even write your favorite poetry for inspiration, as long as it's handwritten and uh, on one side of a standard size sheet of paper, all right? But don't, use your old, don't take your old cheat sheet and, and write on the back. That's not acceptable. Okay. Any questions about the logistics? I'm sorry? Yes, if, there is, if you have room on the, on the same side, yeah, sure, but don't write on the, on the back of the, of the cheat sheet that you had before. It has to, one side should be empty, should be blank. Written with invisible ink, perhaps. Any other questions about the logistics? Everybody's very excited about the, you know, Thursday, this Thursday, next Thursday. Okay, no more questions. All right, so today we'll have a, you have a question, all right. How is what? How is the class curve? It's all explained here. Well, it's not strictly speaking question about the upcoming midterm, okay? But so uh, let me just say this: uh, the, if there is a difference between sections, we will make we will make adjustments for this, okay? Don't worry about it. My experience, though, is that it almost never happens because the way it's set up, the way it's set up is, is it's set up in such a way so as not to, not to let that happen, okay? So don't worry, everybody is in the same, in the, in the same boat, everybody in the same, in the same position, on, on equal footing, okay? The question was about quizzes, how quizzes, the different sections, how are they going to be accounted, if, if there is a difference. And I said that if there is a difference in quiz scores in different sections, we'll, we'll make adjustments for it. But uh, in my experience, that almost never happened because we actually take precautions for that. All right. Now, review, review of the material for the, for the midterm. 
we will be, uh, the, the midterm will cover the material after the first, the first midterm exam. This is not to say that you should forget everything you knew before the first midterm, okay? Because of course, some of that material will be, is used implicitly. We are building on a lot of things that we've learned before the first midterm, like equations of planes, equations of lines, and things like that, parametric curves, and so on, okay? But there will be no focus on the material before the first midterm. In other words, there wouldn't be a problem which is, can be solely solved by means of the material that was learned before the first midterm. Yes? You wouldn't need to, like, parameterize? Yeah. <laughs> if, if, that, if that is something which was, cover, which was discussed after the, f the first midterm, then perhaps yes. But not in a way it was discussed before the first midterm. You see what I mean? All right. Okay, so now let me go over this, this material. Let me summarize it and kind of give an, an, an overview. As I said many times, you can break calculus into two big parts, the differential calculus and the integral uh, calculus, or integration calculus, which are in some sense opposite to each other, okay? And so this material that we are talking about now can also be broken into two big parts. One is uh, about differential calculus, differential calculus, and the other one is uh, integral calculus. Differential calculus was, we came first, uh, we first talked about that, and then we, the most uh, recent lectures we devoted to the integral calculus. So let me first talk about the differential calculus. What are the main points here that you need to know? Okay, the first one is directional derivative. Directional derivative. If you have a function in two variables, and you fix a point, then you have many different derivatives that you can take of this function at this point. These derivatives are parameterized by the choice of a direction vector. And the direction vector, which we usually denote by u, has two components, a, b, is the unit vector which is to say that its norm or length, which is just you know, a squared plus b squared square root, is 1. And the directional derivative of the function f with respect to such a vector at this point is, can be given by, in the, uh, by, by different formulas, but the one which we use the most is, is the formula as a dot product between u and another vector, which is determined by the function and the points, which is called the gradient vector. What is a gradient vector? It's a vector which has two components, and the first one is the derivative, is a partial derivative of this function at this point with respect to x, and the second one is the derivative with respect to y. So we put, we put two partial derivatives together as components of a, of a vector, and that's what we call the gradient vector. And the directional derivative is best understood as a dot product between that gradient vector and the direction vector, which in the usual sense. Okay, so what can we learn from this formula? So first of all, what is the meaning of this directional derivative? The meaning is it gives us the rate of change, rate of change of a function f at the point x0, y0 in the direction of u. In the direction of u. And from this formula, we can find various, I can obtain information about, about the directional derivative. For example, we can find out in what direction 
we can achieve the maximal possible rate of change or the maximal possible directional derivative. So the, um, the maximal, maximum value for this directional derivative is achieved when we take vector u to, be, to go in the direction of the gradient. Now, naively, we would just say that it is equal to the gradient, but we don't want to do that because this is not necessarily a unit vector. And we have, uh, the convention is that the direction, the direction vector, it's called the direction vector, the direction vector has to be a unit vector. So what we need to do is we need to normalize this. We have to divide by the length of this. I'm skipping the x0, y0 just to simplify notation. So we have to divide by the length. If we divide by the length, the resulting vector will have length 1. So it will be a unit vector. So that's, that, that's the maximum value. Maybe I should say maximum value is achieved, achieved if u is equal to this. And what is that value? Then the directional derivative with respect to this u is equal to just the, um, the absolute value or the norm, the norm of the gradient vector. Because when you take the dot product, you are going to get in the numerator the square of the norm, and then you'll divide by the norm, so you'll end up with the norm. Okay? That's the maximum value. Now, minimal value, minimal value is when we take the opposite direction, which it kind of makes sense. You, you achieve the steepest ascent in one direction, and the steepest descent will be achieved in the opposite direction. So this will be minus. Okay? And what is the value is, uh, is going to be minus, not low. And finally, you can get zero value, zero, if u is perpendicular. Does this, is this clear? Perpendicular to the gradient vector. By the way, how do you find the perpendicular vector? Suppose you have a vector AB. And you want to find a vector which is perpendicular to it. You just take negative BA. Right? Because then if you multiply, if you take the dot product, you get negative BA plus BA, which is 0. So it's a very simple rule to, to find a perpendicular vector. But of course, keep in mind that we are finding the per we are So what we need to do here to find U, we have to take the 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 gradient, let's call it alpha beta, because I don't want to confuse it with u itself. Okay, and um, so we just switch, switch them and put a negative sign in front of one of them, and, and uh, but then you have to normalize it, so you have to, div you have to divide this by the square root of alpha squared plus beta squared. But, so for the maximum and minimum, there is a unique solution. It's uh, it's the gradient vector divided by its norm and minus gradient vector divided by its norm. But for the direction for which the, the derivative is zero, there are two solutions because there are two, if, if this is u, then you have two different, um, um, sorry, if, if this is nabla, nabla f, if this is nabla f, there are, two, there are two vectors which are unit vectors and perpendicular to it, this one and this one. This is u1, and this is u2. So if you have a question on the, on the test which, uh, to find the directions in which the, the direction derivative is equal to 0, you have to give two answers, right? You have to give this one and this one. So in fact, it's this vector, and it's negative, it's plus minus. For both of these, the dot product is 0. OK, and, um, and we talked about the meaning of directional derivative, what it represents. It represents the rate of change. And uh, the fact that this, uh, the gradient vector, the, the vector of steepest ascent, is actually a vector perpendicular to the level curve, which brings us to to another to the next to the next topic, which is tangent tangents 
and normals to level curves and surfaces. Level curves and surfaces. So a level curve is a, is a curve on the plane which is given by the equation f of x, y equals some k. So that's level curve, right? And the level surface is something like this, but uh, when you have three variables. So it's a surface in three-dimensional space. This is level surface. In both cases, k is a number. So uh, this is a number. And you s look at all solutions. For example, if, uh, if, x, if f is x squared plus y squared, this will, this will represent circles if k is positive. And likewise, if you here, say, if you have x squared plus y squared plus z squared, this will be uh, spheres centered at the origin. And so now, suppose you have a point on this, um, on this level curve, on a level surface, and we can talk about tangent lines and tangent, uh, tangent lines here, tangent lines here, normal lines in both cases. So say x0, y0 is a point on this level curve. Right? So then uh, the normal vector, normal vector is the gradient vector. So this is closely related, in fact, to the discussion of, um, of the rate of change or directional derivatives because th the best way to think about level curves is to think in terms of uh, maps. On the maps, usually, or oftentimes, you have these curves. And we, we kind of really used to this. It gives us a good understanding of the, of the landscape because each curve corresponds to you know, the points of equal height over the sea level. And so uh, you can think of this as a picture of a mountain and, uh, and, and say climber could be somewhere here and function f would be the, the contour of the mountain. The, so more precisely, the, the graph of the function f would be the entire contour of the mountain, which would be something like this. And, and here we're just looking at the level curves of that, of that mountain, right? So so finding directional derivative would be a question of finding how quickly a climber would be climbing or descending if he or she were going in a, in a certain direction. So that would be a vector u. So you, you, for, for a given vector u, you can ask what is the rate of change of the, what is, this, what is the um, rate of climb. And of course, from this point of view, it's, it's clear how you would achieve the highest, the steepest uh, ascent the steepest climb, exactly if you would go perpendicular to the level curve. And so a vector perpendicular to level curve is a, is a gradient vector. And, uh, or if you want the steepest descent, it would have to be negative. It's negative, right? So that's not layer. And so everything is consistent because we know from the, just algebraically from this calculation, we know that the maximum rate of change, maximum directional derivative, is achieved in the direction of the gradient. And geometrically, we know that the gradient is a normal or perpendicular vector to the level curve. So both of those, two, those two statements fit very well together, right? Because intuitively, it's clear that you will achieve the maximum rate of change precisely as you go perpendicular to the, to the level. And also, if you, the, the, zero level, the zero directional derivative would correspond going along the, along the slope, which would be parallel, parallel to the slope, so it would be perpendicular to the, to the gradient. So, so if you have this picture in mind, then all of this becomes very real. Not, not abstract, but real, very concrete. Okay? So what, what does it mean that it's a normal vector? So for example, you can be asked, what is, the, write down the equation of a normal line to the, to the level curve. So you can write the equation of the normal line just simply by, in the usual, in the way which we learned before at the very beginning of this course, right? So the equation of normal line 
would be uh, the easiest would be to write it in um, in parametric form. So sometimes you may be asked to parameterize something, but in conjunction with sort of some higher math, if you will, uh, finding a gra uh, gradient vectors and, and uh, normal normal lines. So that would be x zero plus. Let's say this is alpha beta, as before. So this would be alpha t, and then this would be y zero plus beta t. And also, you can write. Uh, you can be asked to write the equation of the tangent of the tangent uh, line, which you can easily write by using this information. And likewise, here too, if you have a function in three variables, you also have the gradient vector. which now has three components, right? So it's f sub x, f sub y, and f sub z. And at evaluated at those points. And uh, this is, again, the, the normal vector. And so, for example, again, you can be asked to write the equation of a normal line, and you do it in exactly the same way as here. And you can also be asked to write the equation of the tangent plane. And the equation of the tangent plane would be simply um, f sub x times x minus x zero plus f sub y, y minus y zero plus f sub z, z minus z zero. So here we kind of in, in, encroach on the, on the territory of the previous, of the previous midterm because at the very end of the of that, of that segment of the course, just before the first midterm, we discussed the differential and the tangent planes to graphs of functions. And this can be viewed as a special case of this uh, finding tangent planes to general level surfaces. Tangent plane to the graph, to the, to the level surface. So in fact, um, I devoted quite a bit of time at one of the lectures uh, about a month ago, explaining the connection between tangent, line, tangent planes for level surfaces in general and tangent planes to graphs of functions. And at that time, I explained that, that, that graphs correspond to a very special case uh, of level surfaces, the case where, let me erase, erase something. So for graphs, graph, uh, for graphs f is equal to some function f of x, y. Mm. Let me write it this way. You have a function in three variables, which in fact is determined by a function in two variables, f, x, y minus z. So the level surface for this simply corresponds to z equals f of x, y. So it gives you the graph of the function f capital. And so uh, being a special case, you can, you can also use this general formula to describe the tangent plane. And so what will happen is that here you'll get negative 1. So, uh, this will be in this special case, it will be negative 1. So the equation will simplify. OK? So that's what you need to know, essentially. Uh, by the way, when I talk about um, rate of change in directional derivatives, here I talk about functions in two variables. But in fact, the same analysis can be applied to functions in three variables. You just need a unit vector in three space as u, right? And then you can, uh, the same formula would define the directional derivative for a function in three variables. Again, it will involve the gradient which is now given by this formula with three components, and so on. And again, the maximum will be achieved in the direction of the gradient, the minimum in the opposite direction, and so on, OK? There will be more than two vectors now for this last condition. There will be a whole variety of vectors which are perpendicular to, to, the, to the gradient. Any questions about this? Yes? Um, okay. Suppose that f is given by this formula. In this case, what is what is f sub z the 
partial derivative with respect to z. It's negative one, right? So that means in this case, the equation for the tangent plane will be like this, where instead of this, you'll just have negative one. So it will then take the usual form, uh, z equals, z minus z zero is equal to this. And that's the formula for the, the equation of the tangent plane to graph of function, which we studied just before the first midterm. So, so it might be a good idea to review that, just in case, because it's an, it's an important special case of this story. It was kind of a slightly unnatural break. You know, the first midterm came just after we did this, but before we talked about tangent planes to general surfaces. So it's, it probably makes sense. It would probably be a good idea to review those couple of sections just before the first midterm. Okay. Any other questions? Um, I w I'm a little pressed on time, so I'm a little worried that I will not be able to, if I do that, I would be not be able to talk about some other topics. So if I have time left, then I'll come back to this. Is that okay? All right. So um, what's next? Next, next big topic here is, um, is maxima and minima. Maxima and minima of functions. And this can be viewed as an application of the, of the differential calculus. So what, is, what do you need to know here? First of all, you have to remember that there are, there are two types of uh, maxima and minima. There are local ones and the global ones. And there is a totally different game, finding the local ones and finding the global ones. So let's talk about the local first. The local ones are the ones which are just kind of little bumps. Could be just little bumps. They're not necessarily Kalimanjaro, you know, or uh, the, a big mountain. It could be just a little bump somewhere on the, on the street. That's, a, that's, a local, that's what the local maximum is, or likewise minimum, a little bit, you know. So um, in other words, the, the value at that point should be greater than values that even on a, in a very, very small neighborhood of that point. And that's where we can uh, do well by simply, by, by simply applying derivatives and by, by analogy with one dimensional case. So the, the, first, um, uh, the first criterion that we have for having um, a local maximum and minimum is the, the first derivative criterion. Simply, uh, put, it, it is saying the following, that suppose, yeah, or if f of x, y has local, has local um, maximum or minimum, so th there is a word for this, extremum, extremum, or plural, plural would be extrema. So let's call it extremum, because otherwise I have to say always a maximum, minimum, maximum, minimum, and it's too much. So as local extremum at some point x0, y0, and its partial derivatives, partial derivatives at this point exist, exist, then they have to be equal to zero. have to equal zero. So this is, the first, this is the first test. In other words, if it is a local uh, minimum, a minimum or maximum and the partial derivatives exist, then they both have to vanish. The, the converse, however, is not true. If both partial derivatives vanish, it does not mean that it is a local maximum minimum. You have a question? Yeah, you said that they have to be zero both ways in the Yeah, I knew, I knew that. Uh, it's always the case. I try to save some space, but then I have to go over it again, so I lose more time, right? And more space. So I mean the two partial derivatives. This. Fx. Let's just do it the right way. Is that better? Okay. So 
converse is not true. It could be, which uh, we discussed even in the one dimensional case. Uh, think of the x, y equals x cubed. The function x cubed has vanishing derivative, but the graph looks like this. The point zero is not, is not a point of maximum or minimum. But there is a test. which involves second derivatives. So there is a second derivative derivative test. Namely, we, we form the following quantity. We take the x, x, x0, y0 times f, y, y at x0, y0 minus f x y this assuming of course that all of this exists all of these derivatives exist and are continuous <coughs> at this point so the test is the following that if d is greater than if d is greater than 0 and f x x uh, at x 0 y 0 is greater than 0 then it's a minimum. Then, okay, I'm abbreviating. Then x0, y0 is a minimum. If d is greater than 0 and f x, let's, let's say, less than 0, then maximum. Then maximum. I mean, x0, y0 is. Uh, local is local, local, local minimum, local maximum. And if d is less than zero, then it's a, what's called a saddle point. Is a saddle point, like a saddle point. So neither, neither maximum nor minimum. And the saddle is what you get when you look at the, what is it called? Um, hyperbolic paraboloid. Yes? Is that FXY squared in the top? Yes, it is. That's right. So you remember we had this, there's this, there's this figure, one of kind of the fanciest um, quadric surface that we discussed, the hyperbolic paraboloid, which looks like a saddle. So if you go in some direction, you fall, you fall, fall down. But if you go in other directions, you go up. So it's neither maximum nor minimum locally. Okay. So that's if d is less than zero, then that's the, that's the kind of point you have. So that's how you know it's not. But um, otherwise, if d is zero, for example, if d is, no information, if d is zero, if d is zero, it could go either way. Okay. We didn't talk much about why this criterion is true. I only made a few comments. The point is that to understand it, you should really look at just quadric surfaces. Because uh, as we discussed, a function, the first approximation to a function is a linear function. In other words, it's a, you approximate it by the first derivatives. And the next level of approximation is given by quadratic derivatives. So. But two functions have the same quadratic derivatives if they have the same sort of Taylor expansion in degrees one and two. And the higher order terms in the expansion, they don't really matter locally, when you look at it locally. So to understand what, what's going on here, you should look no further than just quadratic functions, functions which uh, are polynomials of degree two, combined degree two in x and y. And uh, for such functions, this expression is actually a number. And if you look, if you just plug this formula, in this formula, some of your favorite examples like, you know, elliptic paraboloid and uh, hyperboloids and all this, and, and this kind of uh, functions, you will see how this criteria, how this criteria work. The reason why we choose this fancy combination of, of second derivatives is that, um, is the, the point is that the behavior of the, of the graph is not necessarily determined by the coefficients of the polynomial, but they are determined by sort of the main axis. Um, uh, when we talked about quadratic, quadratic functions and quadratic surfaces, we talked about the fact that 
you can always make a change of variables to bring it to a nice form. Well, when you bring it to a nice form, you will get a very simple expression for the second derivatives. And then this will become so simple form, meaning, say, ax squared plus by squared. If you bring it to such a form, you will see that this is a, and this is b, and this is 0, because there's no cross term. Right? So for such a function, if f is this function, d is equal to, let's just kind of small, small in insert here, d is equal to ab. And so then you can very, very easily see what, um, what those scenarios correspond to, because d greater than 0 and fxs greater than 0 means that a is, a is positive and b is positive. So we are dealing with a, with a paraboloid. The graph of this function is a paraboloid, is an elliptic paraboloid, which it goes like this. So clearly we have a minimum. This case corresponds to both A and B being negative. So that's upside down paraboloid, maximum. And uh, when it's less than zero, it means that one of them is positive and one of them is negative, and that gives you the hyperbolic paraboloid. So this is a way to, to understand this criterion by simply looking at such expression, at such functions. And then a more general quadratic function can be always brought to this form and what tells you what the D is for, for that form is this expression. Uh, anyway, we don't, need, uh, we don't need to get too much into detail of this criterion. Ju you just have to, know what the, you have to know this criterion. And you should understand it for this particular function, how it works, AX squared plus BY squared. Okay, so that takes care of, of the local maximum and minimum. And in some sense, it's a little bit Disappointing because we, we don't have a conclusive criteria. But the same is true also for functions in one variable. Functions in one variable, we don't really have, if you just use first and second derivatives, you cannot really make a conclusive uh, statement in general whether it has a local maximum or minimum. So it's not so surprising. So what's, what's more uh, kind of um, pleasant in some sense and uh, satisfying is um, the case of global maximum and minima. In this case, we can usually find the complete solution by following a, a, a basic algorithm. So let's talk about this, global. So global is a, a global maximum and minima is a totally different game where you are actually given a certain region, say if it's a function in two variables, you're given a region <coughs> in R2, or if it's a function in three variables, it would be a region in R3. And you have to find points within that region only. You don't care about what happens outside, only within that region where the function takes the maximum and minimum values, right? So the algorithm here consists of essentially two steps, although you can sometimes phrase it as in terms of two steps, sometimes in terms of three steps. But basically, the first step would be to find global global extrema first of all you have to find points in d where both partial derivatives vanish these are the points which are suspicious because of the first of the first derivative cr criterion because those could be the points of local maxima and minima, and local maxima and minima could potentially be global maxima and minima as well. Right? So we have to find all of those points. In fact, you, you, you don't have to look at, uh, in, this, in this part of the, of the algorithm, you don't have to look at the boundary because the second part of the algorithm takes care of specifically of the boundary. But you, when you write these formulas, okay, if you, get a, if you get a point on the boundary, you include it as well. Why not? And so, and the second part is to focus exclusively on the boundary. Focus on the boundary. Boundary and, and find extrema on the boundary, on this boundary. Find the extrema of the function. Function restricted to, to this boundary. So here there are, there are basic two essential, essentially two different w ways, two different approaches. 
if the boundary is linear, in other words, if it is given by linear equation, like x equals some, something, x equals 5, or x plus y equals 0, you can simply substitute this equation into the function and get a function in one variable, and then solve the, solve the problem by doing uh, functions in one variable. Right? So first step, first possibility is um, a boundary is given by linear equations. Given by linear equations. Linear meaning is just degree one in x and y. Example, let's say f is equal to x squared plus y squared, and the boundary, one, one segment, one part of the, one component or segment of the boundary of the boundary is, say, x plus y equals 0. Well, then you can simply express y in terms of x, y equals negative x, and you can substitute it into this formula. So instead of a function in two variable, which you originally have, you will see that the, when this function is restricted to the boundary, it effectively becomes a function in one variable, namely x. So you get that this restriction, restriction to this x plus y equals 0 is just you know, x squared plus negative x squared, which is 2x squared. So you had a function in two variables, but on the boundary it becomes effectively a function in one variable. If you have a very complicated equation for, for the boundary, you may not be able to so easily express y in terms of x or x in terms of y and then substitute. But if it's a linear equation, you can always express easily one in terms of the other, and then you simply substitute, and then the remaining variable will be the only variable left. You will get a function one variable. So then just solve the problem by using the methods of the calculus of one variable, which is you just look at the where, where the derivative of the function vanishes on that. Well, in general, it's not going to be this entire line. It's going to be some interval on this line. Right? Like I said, it's only, a, it's only a component of the boundary. In general, it's, the boundary is going to have many components. For example, boundary could be, could have this as a component, and then it could have part of a circle as another component. So, except, of course, I didn't draw the right. This is not x plus y equals 0, but it's x equals y. OK, let's do it the right way. This is x plus y equals 0. OK. But OK, so maybe this is not, it's not a good, because I don't want to write it like it's my function is x squared plus y squared, and I want let's just make it something complicated. It could be something like this, right? I'm not saying I'll put th exactly this one on the, on the exam. But I'm just saying for the sake of the argument, OK, just as an example. So you could have this very simple component like this. When you restrict your function, it becomes a function in one variable. You can choose which one, x or y. You express the other one in terms of this, one, uh, the, the original one, so y in terms of x. Substitute, get a function in one variable, solve the problem, um, namely find the extreme of the function on this interval by using methods of one variable cal calculus, one variable. That's the first possibility. The second possibility, you have something like this, which is given by a much more complicated function. Rather than x plus y, it could be something with higher uh, degrees, uh, or even could be some more complicated functions altogether. In this case, this method will not work, because you will not be able to easily express one variable in terms of the other and substitute. So you have to use something else. And that something else is Lagrange method. So I would say. This is what I call 2A. So that's the method. That's the easy method. And the slightly more complicated method is the Lagrange method. Lagrange method. So Lagrange method is about um, 
So in this case, um, it's about solving a system of equations. So in this case, you, your component, your component of the boundary would be given by, by the equation g of x, y equals k, or g some function. And so you will write the following equations. You will write nabla f, f is a function which you try to, to maximize, minimize, is lambda nabla g, and then you also have g of x, y equals k. So solve this system. And then, of course, there is, a, there is an additional issue, which is that there could be corners. There could be um, kind of uh, no points which are not smooth on the boundary. And these have to be treated separately. I mean, you can think of treating them not separately, but you can think of treating them within the context of 2a or 2b, because when you do, when you do that, you have, to talk, uh, you have to take care of the endpoints anyway. Or you can just think of corners as a separate entity, or a, a completely separate entity, and just put them on the list at the, at the very end. But you have to include them. Okay? So, so usually the way I explained it is, is you do the, corner, the corners, which are corner by corners. I mean points which are not smooth points, like this. In this case, this two. So basically, it boils down to the following. You might have a sort of an easy case where you might have sort of an easy case where the boundary is smooth. For example, boundary could be an ellipse. This is exactly the example which we studied originally in class. In this case, there are no corners. There are no corners, so you don't have to worry about it. You just do Lagrange method here. Okay? But if you have something like this, then you have corners, and you have to take care of them separately. Or you can think of that, of taking care of them as part of analyzing the segments of the boundary. Is that clear? Yes? Will Lagrange find, find them for us? That's a very good question. Uh, Lagrange not, will not necessarily find them for, for us, right? For exactly the same reason why, core, why the endpoints would not necessarily be found just from the, uh, in the one variable calculus, from, the calculating, from finding points with, de with derivative zero. <coughs> what was the issue if you had a function one variable? Let's say you have a graph of a function. Um, let me do it in this way. You see, here is it's a very good illustration because here this is a maximum point, which is a also a local maximum. So it, it, we will catch it in a first, at the first step if we were doing it for one variable function. Right? But this is a minimum, and it's a minimum not because it, the derivative vanishes. It's still, it, the derivative is not zero, but because it's the end point, because we can't go any further. Likewise here, remember we had a, a discussion about how the, there were two points which were the points where the level curve of the function f were tangent, level curves of the function f, which in my example back then was a linear function, were touching, were tangent to the, to the level curve, to the constraint, to this, to, this, to this curve, right? Now, okay, great, but what if, my, what if my curve ended here? What if my curve was just like this? From here to here. Then, okay, I would catch this one as a minimum, just like here. So it would actually be given to me by Lagrange. But what about maximum? Lagrange would give me this, which is actually not part of this segment. Because my picture could be like this. My domain could be, could be like this. And what would happen in this case is that actually the maximum would be achieved at the corner. So Lagra just, just because it's Lagrange method, it doesn't mean it doesn't have its own limitations, right? It, it has the same limitations as other methods that we have studied, which involve derivatives. But it's a very good question. It's a very good point. Yes? That's a good question. So the question is, uh, do we have to worry about subtle points and when, we're doing, when we are doing global maximum and minima? And the answer is no, because, uh, because precisely because it's a sort of a different sort of a game. 
that we are, um, we will certainly catch them in, in part one. Because in part one, we are taking, we are just grabbing all the points we can get where the derivatives are zero. So in particular, we'll get a lot of saddle points in general. But um, I guess I didn't finish the algorithm. The point is that, of course, at the end of the day, we're going to just evaluate our function at all of these points. So the, the saddle points, will will just get rid of them in a natural way because they will be, they will just turn out to be fake, sort of, they will not be maximum minima, right? So the, maybe I should say that the end, the end of the algorithm is to evaluate function, uh, function f at all of these points. Uh, and find maximum minima. Possibly multiple. It could be that there are two different points where you get the same value, so you have to list them all. So if you, if the question on the test is, give all the, all the maximum minima of this function on this domain, and let's say this function has two maxima, two points where it takes the same maximum value, and you only give one, then Obviously, you will uh, you will lose some points on this right? because uh, this is not comp this would not be a complete answer. A complete answer would have to include all of the points with maximum value as well as points with minimum value. Now there are a couple of tricky points here as far as Lagrange method is concerned, which I wanted to emphasize. Well, first of all, I want to stress that Lagrange method is used in two entirely different types of problems. The first problem is a problem like I just described, where you have a two-dimensional domain, and you want to find global maxima and minima. And then you have, to, you have to worry about the interior of this domain, and then you worry about the boundary. And when you get to the boundary, if the boundary is complicated, you have to use Lagrange method. Right? But there is a different type of problem altogether where you just are asked to find maximum minima um, on, a, on a level curve. In other words, you don't, you don't have the interior, you don't have the two-dimensional region with a boundary, but you just have a curve, right? So in that case, of course, you don't need to do part one. You just do the Lagrange method for this curve, and that's it. See, so that, that's an important thing to remember, that you have to understand what the problem is. If you're asked to just analyze the curve, you don't have to see what happens in, in, in the interior. Now, in all of this discussion, I assumed, so maybe I will write that Lagrange method, Lagrange method can also be used to find maxima and minima on a, on a, on a, on a curve like this, g of x, y equals k. So in this case, no, there is no interior. No interior. So you don't have to do the uh, partial derivatives on the interior and so on. Just apply Lagrange method to this. And there are actually a couple of tricky points, which we did not talk about in class, but which were <coughs> uh, part of some of the homework exercises, which I wanted to draw your attention to. So the tricky points are that there are two tricky points. Yeah. Where the Lagrange method does not work in the, in the best possible way, as, as, as um, explained here. Okay? And the tricky points are, the first of all, this works, maybe I will just say it in one, one sentence. This works well, this works well, the method works well if, first of all, this curve is bounded. If the curve does not go to infinity. This is actually something we did talk about in class. I, I did give an example like this. If, number one, the curve is bounded. You see what I mean? Bounded means that it is, it is like this. 
as opposed to you know something which goes to infinity more, more precisely bounded means that you can um, you can cover it by a, a sufficiently large a, a disk of a sufficiently large radius on the homework there was a, there was an extra kind of a tricky exercise which was x cube I think it was something like x cube plus y cube equals one or something and it looks uh, um, deceptively uh, uh, simple because it looks almost like x squared plus y squared equals one. So this is bounded, right? This is bounded because it's a circle of radius one. But this is not bounded, so this is an important point. And the reason is, of course, that see this is, here you have a sum of squares, and squares are always positive or zero. So if the sum of squares is equal to one, you can see. All right. All right. This is the sum of two numbers which are positive and equals to one. So it means that each of them has to be less than one, between zero and one. And that puts the bounds, of course, x and y can only be between one and negative one, right? That's why it's bounded. But here you have cubes, and cube could be both positive and negative. So x could go to plus infinity and y go to neg minus infinity as long as they add up to one, which is e very easy to find. So I'm not going to try to draw this, but this is not bounded for sure. It goes because you will, uh, x could be arbitrar arbitrarily large, and then y would be just negative of that. So for such a curve, all bets are off in the sense that it may not have a maximum or a minimum, or it may not even have either. We talked about this, right? So so be careful. When you apply Lagrange method, for example, it is very tempting. Say you get two points, and it's very tempting to say that one of them is a maximum, the other one is a minimum, right? And that would be true if, in fact, the, the, the curve is bounded. Because on the bounded curve, it has to have a maximum and has to have a minimum. And if you got two solutions for Lagrange method, that means one of them has to be maximum, one of them has to be minimum. You just evaluate it. They would have to have different values. And so you will know which one is which. But I think in this problem, I forgot, either, either there was only one point, you got only one point, which is like, wow, why do I get only one point? Where is this, uh, if it's a maximum, where is the minimum? If it's a minimum, where is the maximum? Or I, maybe there were two points, but they had the same value, which is like even worse, because what does it mean? So the, but both maximum and minimum, does it mean the function is constant? Well, it's not constant. So the solution of this, the resolution of this paradox is that when the curve is not bounded, which is in this case, when the curve is not bounded, you may not have, may not have maximum or minimum or even you may be a situation where you don't have either. So you have, to, you have to take this into account. That's number one. And there is one more little trick, which is the other thing that could happen is that in this equation, the equation which we use for Lagrange, in the Lagrange method, it is perfectly okay for nabla f to be zero because that would correspond to the solution where lambda is equal to zero, right? But it, ca it can happen also that nabla g is zero. And if nabla g is zero and nabla f is not zero, that would correspond to lambda equal infinity. So you wouldn't be able to solve this. So this is, this, this is one remaining possibility which we haven't really talked about. But there was at least one exercise on homework where this was the case. So you have to also be careful about this. In fact, this is uh, this point where nabla g is, um, is zero and also, but this equation is still satisfied. They are actually corners. They are actually s singular points of, the, of this curve. So in that sense, they kind of get under the rubric of corners, so they have to be analyzed separately. But just looking at the equation, you may not realize it right away because you would have to really visualize. So just keep in mind, that if something's going funny, like if the method doesn't work quite the right way, if you get only one solution or you get two solutions with the same value of the function, see if the curve is bounded, see if there is a possibility that this is equal to zero. Because that you have to include those points separately. And then of course, when you are solving this kind of, this kind of equations, you have to be always careful when you cancel out things on both sides of the equation. You know that, right? If you, if you cancel things out, it means that they are, they are non-zero, because it means like you're dividing by these quantities. So you have to allow for the possibility that they are equal to zero 
And this may actually where this may be where your lost solutions are. Okay, I'm I'm purposefully purposefully trying uh, spending more time on this differential uh, part of the because we talked about integrals for the last uh, what three weeks, and this is something which was came earlier. So I kind of wanted to make more emphasis on on, the, on that part. But the good news for you, the good news is that you are not responsible for um, for the case when there are two constraints. Um, somehow I expected a more, uh, a more enthusiastic response to this. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, good. thank you. Okay, because I was thinking, why am I even bothering saying this, you know? Maybe they should be responsible for it. No, no. okay, okay, all right. So, but in the book... That's right. Well, that's the problem. So, uh, if you don't know what you what I meant, that that's a, that's a problem for for everybody. In the book. All right. Uh, let me let me explain. Don't explain it to your neighbor. Um, in the book, there at the very end of the chapter on like, uh, section on Lagrange multipliers, there is a discussion of uh, two constraints. Because this is called constraint. This is called constraint. And, and uh, this is Lagrange method for a single constraint because here we have two variables and we, ha we impose one equation or constraint, so we we'll end up with a curve. If we impose a second constraint here, we'll get finite number of points, so it's not interesting. Uh, finite number of points, there will be no derivatives, you just evaluate at those points and that's it. But if you consider the case of three variables, then what can have, you can have two possible choices. You can have a situation like this where simply you would just have you know, the third variable, that's a single constraint. And two constraint means that you have another h of x, y, z. And then what, what you need to do is you need to write lambda nabla g plus mu nabla h. So it becomes much more complicated. And I actually did not put any problems of this type on the homework. And you are actually not responsible for this. So don't, so maybe I shouldn't have even mentioned because now, yeah. Now maybe people get more, will get more worried about it. But, Okay, just to be clear. Okay, any questions about this? Any, any other questions about maximum and minima? Yes? Very good. So the question is, if the, point, if the curve is not bounded, how do we see if it's a maximum or minimum? Well, in this example, I, I forgot already now, but I, I did this example, I think, or something very similar in class. And in that case, um, you just have to look at, um, at, at those in the neighborhood of this point. If you, if you move slightly away from the point you have found, does the function grow or becomes value or decrease? Does it increase or decrease? You see? And that's how you know. If, it, if you move a little bit and the function becomes, the value function becomes larger, okay, that's a minimum. And if you move, you see what I mean? So that's, that's how you do it. Okay, so let's now, let's now uh, spend the remaining time to talk about the integral calculus. This is something which we have been doing ju in the last few weeks, but maybe it's a good idea to just briefly summarize the stuff as well. So what do we need to know about integrals? So we study integrals of two different kinds. There are double integrals and there are triple integrals, right? So double integrals are integrals over, over two-dimensional domain of a function in two variables. And triple integrals are, func are integrals of functions in three variables <coughs> over three-dimensional regions, like, the, like a box like this, the interior of this box. So what is the main idea? The main idea is to calculate it by using nothing but single integrals. In other words, in single variable calculus, you spend a lot of time learning how to calculate integrals of functions in one variable. And there is a very efficient tool for doing that, namely finding antiderivative, uh, what's called the fundamental theorem of calculus in one variable or 
uh, Newton Leibniz formula. There is a very efficient tool. You just have you have to take the function, and you have to take its antiderivative and evaluate at the endpoints, and that's it. For functions in two variables, you cannot do it. You cannot evaluate the integral in one shot, because there is no antiderivative as such, because there is not a derivative as such. There are many different derivatives. So that's why there are also many antiderivatives. So in some sense, what we need to do is we need to take first antiderivative with respect to the one variable and then antiderivative with respect to the other variable. That's what we need to do, roughly. But there are different choices. We can first do x and then y, or y and then x. Okay? And that's what sort of complicates matter, matters. But the basic structure of this calculation is always the same you break the calculation of a double integral or a triple integral into a sequence of single integrals. And this is called iterated integration. You do it integral with respect to one variable, followed by integration with respect to the other variable. So we talked about this uh, a lot. And uh, the important point is here is to find the correct order, right? This correct order of integration, which is essentially finding the best possible way of sort of slicing your say, three-dimensional domain or um, two-dimensional domain in such a way that the resulting integration will be, uh, so will be the easiest to handle, okay? And because there are multiple choices, right, sometimes you will get something easy and sometimes you'll get something hard. So if you're getting something which looks very hard, something which involves antiderivative of some really complicated function, chances are you're not using the most optimal way. I'm talking about the midterm because it's not my goal on the midterm to put some really complicated, to, to test your knowledge of single in integrals, single variable integrals. My, my goal is to test your understanding how to calculate double and triple integrals. So if you encounter some really complicated single integrals, try a different way, okay? So what are, what are these different ways? First of all, changing the order of integration, right? So first of all, changing the order of integration. This is where you can already achieve quite a lot. So changing the order of integration, and I think that one of the, actually, one of the problems on the mock midterm is like this. Or maybe not. Um, changing order of integration, that's number one. So for that, you actually say if you're given an integral, which is already given as an iterated integral, you have to first reconstruct the domain which, which, it, rep which it represents, or integration over which it represents. And then you have to figure out how to slice it in a different way to get a an integral in the opposite direction. Okay, so that's that's the first that's the first trick. And the second trick, which is slightly which is more advanced, something which we studied at the very end uh, last week and so on, is using different uh, using a different coordinate system. Using a different coordinate system. So here the, you, have, you have some basic coordinate systems, basic ones, which of course are, uh, you should always keep in mind. And the basic ones are the polar, cylindrical, and spherical. Right? So these are, these are always polar. Polar, cylindrical, and spherical. But you should also, also be able to devise your own coordinate system by looking at the problem itself. And uh, so this, I'm talking about really the material of last week. So if you look in the book, if you look at the uh, homework, of the, at the last homework exercises, you know, it, it sort of leaps in your eyes. For example, you look at the problem number 19. It says the, the, function, the function that needs to be integrated is x minus x minus 
So number 19, you have x minus 2y divided by 3x minus y. And then you have the, the region is bounded by lines. Uh, you know, uh, x minus 2y equals something, and 3x minus y equals something. OK, so if you look at this, it should be clear to you what are the coordinates that it should use. Right? This should be your coordinate u, and this should be your coordinate v. Because then everything simplifies. First of all, the function becomes u over v. The constraint the region becomes you know, a box in u and v and so on. So things become much simpler. So usually, it should, it should be clear from the context. Because if, so if you notice sort of the, the same pattern for function and for, for the region, chances are you should change variables. You have a question? Uh, should we simplify based on the bounds or based on the function? Should we simplify based on the bounds or based on the function? Both. Now, in this case, it's sort of, it's almost too easy, right? Because it's almost too easy because they are the same. They, they, they send the same message, right? But in fact, what if this was not, what if this was more complicated? Let's say it was x and this was y. It's not a big deal. It would, in this case, it would pay, pay off more to simplify on the basis of the function because instead of this very complicated thing, you would have just u over v, which you can very easily find in antiderivatives, right? And then x and y, you can easily express in terms of u and v anyway. So you would have some very simple region on the uv plane in, your, in any case, right? But, uh, but if, if, of course, if both the boundaries, um, the bounds and the function involve the same functions, then, OK, so then it shouldn't be too, e too difficult to guess what the, what, those, what the variables are. Yes? Right. Well, you know this expression, use at your own risk, which means in this case that, for example, if the Jacobian is constant, is a number, then it's easy because you take the inverse. If the Jacobian is not constant, if you do it in the opposite direction, instead of getting a function in u and v, you'll get a function in x and y. So first of all, you'll have to invert it, and then you'll have to express x and y in terms of u and v. You see? And so then it sort of defeats the purpose. Of why, why bother? Why not just do it in the right way? You see what I mean? For linear, for linear changes of variables like this, it's sometimes it's easier to do it like you said. The question is really the following. Um, to explain the question, I should say what the formula, I should remind you what the formula is. So let's say for a function in two variables, it's like this, that you can write it as f. So let's say you write x as a function of u and v, and you write y as a function of u and v. And then what you do is you substitute this, right? And then you write du dv, and then you have this additional factor, which is called the Jacobian. I'll just leave it as a question mark. Question mark is equal to is the Jacobian is d of x y over d of u v absolute value. Well, okay, I'm not, I will not write the formula, but it's a formula which was given last time, which is was used in the homework and so on. So just to save time, I will not write it. But uh, the question which was asked just now is what about what about d? You can also calculate d u v over d x y. And in fact, this is inverse of this. This is inverse of this, but understood in the, in the right way. Because the point is that this is a function of u and v, and this is a function of x and y. But if you take this function and substitute x equals function of u v and y equals u v, then it will become the inverse. So sometimes it could simplify matters for you, but, some, but sometimes not. So I would suggest just doing it in a direct way like this. But here there is a very important point, which is that you have to put uh, you have to put this absolute value. I think I mentioned it last time, but maybe maybe too briefly. So I want to really really emphasize it by 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 very very thick, you know, uh, symbols here. 
So this is absolute value. It or put uh, in plain English, it has to be positive, okay? Because it cannot be negative, because if you're calculating the integral of function one, for example, you're calculating the area. And so that means that the function, whatever you insert here will have to be positive. So, in fact, there is a very simple way to keep track of when this is positive and when this is not positive, when it's negative. The point is that if you switch u and v, which in the setup, which I explained, you can easily do. There is no reason to take u over v or v over u. You will get an opposite sign. So you should be aware of this. Maybe, maybe I should write it. I should write it after all. It's like this, right? This minus this. You see, if you switch, if you switch u and v, you will have to switch the, the two rows. And if you switch the two rows, you get the negative sign. Since we did not keep track which order u, v, or v, u is, is the right one, you can get a positive answer or negative answer. That's why we just say put absolute value and not worry about it. Yes? Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. We'll be responsible for? The three for three variables. Change of variables. Yeah. Well, on the test, on the midterm, probably not because it's invo highly involved. Uh, you certainly are resp responsible for spherical. But uh, more general, pr probably not because it, it would be a very hard problem to do in a short period of time. Oh, there, and I have one more gift for you, which is that. Um, you are not responsible for probability also because we didn't really. Uh... All right. Well, I guess finally I strike the chord. I I I, I feel. Uh... <laughs> All right. Very good. So. Hold on. Hold on. So I'm almost done. Just a couple of mo couple more remarks. So absolute value. And um, uh, one other thing which I wanted to say, I said it already last time, about calculating volumes. You should really have a good understanding of what, what, what we're talking about when we talk about volumes. Once, one more time, you can, when you do a double integral, when you do a double integral like this, you are computing the volume of the region under the graph z equals f of x f of x y okay so if you're asked to calculate the volume of something and this something looks like region under the graph you can do it by double integral but if you are asked to do an um, to calculate the volume of some region, which does not necessarily look like uh, area, you know, region under the graph. And when I say under the graph, I put in quotation marks. You know, you know what I mean. It's under the graphs, but above the xy plane, and so on. You can also compute it by doing the integral of the function 1 over the, you know, so this is the volume. This is the most general formula. Most general formula for the volume of a, re of a region in three-dimensional space is the triple integral of function one. Last time I explained how in the case when this region is the region under the graph, you can also express it as a double integral. But keep in mind this difference, okay, that sometimes the volume is best found by a double integral and sometimes by a triple integral, okay? And then, of course, you also have applications of double and triple integrals to computing the mass and center of mass. You are not responsible for the uh, momenta of inertia. You're not responsible for those. But you are responsible for, you should be able to find the mass or the char total charge when you have a, a, a region with a density function as a double or triple integral. You should also be able to find the center of mass. Okay, these are the applications of double and triple integrals. Any other questions? Sorry? Charge. Well, charge is like mass. It's, it's also integral of the density function. Okay?
All right. So we'll have office hours now, so you can have ask me more questions now.